Stop and stop and say, let me tell y'all something. Y'all see what we're talking about right here and how this thing is unfolding? Let me tell you, while I'm telling you this in my mind, I'm having a conversation within my own self. And I'm saying to myself, I can't believe this stuff is coming out of my mouth. I don't, I t I, I'm baffled by it, y'all. I ain't, it, how does things just, that's God. And it's also a relationship with him. That's why, oh my God, the subject, God's love will make us do right. When you're in a love relationship with the Lord God, this is what I know. Proverbs 3, 5, 6 is my foundational scripture for my faith in the Lord. And it simply says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He'll direct your path. I trust God explicitly. When I do that, I don't worry about nothing that's going to come out of my mouth. Because you know why? The word of God lets me know that in him there is no failure. And if in there, if God, there's no failure, well, understand this. If I'm in him and he is in me and I'm trusting him explicitly and then I open myself up to be led and guide, guided by the Holy Spirit, guess what he will not do? He will not say anything that's going to bring failure to God. So all I do is just trust him explicitly. Don't worry about the outcome because he's already assured me in Isaiah 55, 11 what's going to happen. The word's going to go forth. Prosper out of prospering the thing that it was sent to do. It ain't coming back void. Now, if I was trying to hold on to my ego and, and, and make you believe that it's all about Arthur, I'd be messing up. I'd be messing up so bad that you would you and anybody else listening to me would be like, yeah, right. We you want us to believe in God and believe in what you're saying. You don't even say it. you ain't even believing in what God says because we don't hear no God in what you're saying. We hear you. We don't hear no word. Well, I got word for you. I'm in 2 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, the second chapter. And we're in the fifth, 14th verse. But the natural, non-spiritual man does not accept or welcome or admit into his heart the gifts and teaching and revelation of the Spirit of God. For they are folly, meaningless nonsense to him. And he is incapable of knowing them, of progressively recognizing, understanding, become better acquainted with them. Because they are spiritually discerned and estimated and appreciated. You ain't got enough intellect to understand the things of God. Not, it's not by your intellect that you can understand. It's by the Spirit of God. But the spiritual man tries all things. He examines, investigates, inquires into questions, discerns all things. Yet, yet is himself to be put on trial and judged by no one. He can read the meaning of everything, but no one can properly discern or praise or get an insight into him. Now, I like what it says here in the Amplified Bible. I'm going to tell you something else about the gift that God gave me from my very youth. Um, I'm born in Buffalo, New York. So I'm 63 years old. 63, going on 64 years this coming September the 12th. Um, from the, around 1955, I believe, until 1960. I lived with my um, great uncle, Arthur Duncan um, Sr. on this cotton plantation in Mississippi uh, 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 and, and, and from the age of two and a half to five in the Delta in Mississippi, y'all. Silver City, Inverness, Mississippi. Uh, I'm familiar with Yazoo City, Belzoni, Indianola. Amen. That's the, that's the environment that I lived in in the 50s. And, and when I was down, when I was when I was down there, and, and my people from down home, amen, I had a gift and ability, and they used to tell me that I could read people. And I understood that because I used to tell people well before I got saved that, you know what, I'm going to know you. It ain't going to take a long time for me to know you. And they're like, yeah, right. Well, it didn't take a long time. And then I ended up start talking to them about them, and they freak out. And, and they used to say that, and, and that ability they said back then was that I could read people. Uh, uh, biblically, we call it discernment. But here in, I, here in second, first Corinthians second chapter, the 15th verse, let me read over this again. But the spiritual man tries all things. He examines, investigates, inquires into questions, and discerns all things. Yet is himself to be put on trial. Uh, 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 judged by no one. He can read the meaning of everything, but no one can properly discern or praise or get an insight into him. And I believe that's absolutely to be true because to this very day, I got people, they are clueless about me. I got my own people in my own family that don't know me. They grew up with me. They don't know me. I know them because I took time to know them. That's the thing about Christianity, y'all, and I'm very apt about this. This is another pet peeve that God has had me uh, speaking about the last two weeks. Uh, 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 if you're a believer in Christ, understand this. Christianity is not a religion. That's a category. 
That's a category. And, 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 and the world is good to try to categorize us. Things that they don't understand, they want to be able to categorize so they can quantify and explain. Christianity is not a religion, y'all. Because when you understand what God did for us, John 3, 16, John 15, 13, Romans 5, 8. The Bible says that John 6, 3, 16, for God so loved the world. I'm just going to use parts of the scripture. John 15, 13, no greater love does a man have than this. Uh, John uh, Romans 5 8 for God commended his great love for us understand this those there's a, a word that's found in all three of those scriptures and it identifies what Christianity is all about religion there ain't no love in religion y'all religion don't have anything to do about loving anything religion is just being uh, repetitive and doing something over and over and over again watch this when you were growing up in your families y'all might have done something within your family that you did on a regular yes you did and you would say that this is a family tradition. And then sometimes when you ask some people about that family tradition, about what are you doing and why are you doing it, they will tell you something like this. I don't know why. We've always done this in our family. That's a religion. But a relationship is something altogether different. You absolutely will know what you're, why you're in the relationship and what the relationship is about. Why? You take time to cultivate that relationship. You know, we just don't love people just out of, the, out of the blue. Amen. It takes a getting to know somebody to give them some love, to afford us to love them. Amen. We, we, oh my God. How can you trust in somebody with all your heart without having a relationship with them? You can't give your trust to any and everybody. God bless you, Lewis. Thanks for joining us, sir. Uh, uh, yeah, you can't give your trust to just anybody. That takes cultivating and building a relationship. That's why Christianity is not a religion. It is a relationship. And how do we know it's a relationship? What God did for us, y'all. In, second, in Philippians, the second chapter, and I'm going to go back there, y'all. The reason why I'm going back there is because you guys weren't there, weren't here earlier when God had me go there for another reason. But he brought me back there again because for some reason or another, the Lord has me here with this particular verse to try to explain some things. And what we're trying to explain is that um, in John 3.16... Uh, John 15, 13, Romans 5, 8, you find a singular theme in all three of those scriptures and it centers around love and what God did for us. But to understand what he really did, you need to go to Philippians, that second chapter, and start at that fifth verse and let's conclude at verse 8. Let this same attitude, purpose, and humble mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. That's where you got to start first. And then it says in the brackets here in the Amplified Bible, let him be your example in humility. Because we don't know how to be humble. We have no, and don't, you can't look to somebody else. You can't look to your father, your brother, your mother, your sister, your cousin, your aunt, your uncle, your wife, your husband, for act to know how to be humble and have humility. Because outside of Christ, we don't have it. We're, we're, we're selfish. We're more concerned about me, myself, and I. There's no humility, humana, 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 humana. There's no humility found in selfishness. Humility is found in selflessness selflessness why is that so watch what happened verse 6 who although being essentially one with God and in the form of God possessing the fullness of the attributes which make God God simply meaning he was God did not think this equality with God was a thing to be eagerly grasped or retained so what is it saying Jesus Christ was God and we know him to be the Son of God. He's the second of the Trinity of the Godhead of the Triune God. This God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. They represent what is known as the Godhead or the Triune or the Trinity. Now understand this. There's only one God. He just works out of three different offices. Amen. God is a God of order, y'all. He's a God of balance. That's why there was good and evil, blessings and calamity. Amen. Uh, 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 sickness and health. God. That's how he. That's that's the order of God. And so he has that within his own self. So what is he saying? He says, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, didn't think that it didn't think uh, 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 did not think this equality with God, because he was God, was a thing to be eagerly grasped or retained. So what he what was he saying? He wasn't trying to hold on to being who he was. Or to make it in human terms, he wasn't trying to hold on to his title. 
He hold on to his title. Good morning, my sister. That's my sister, y'all. Eliza Jean Dow Nichols. Amen. Praise God. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, he did not think that was equal to hold on. He didn't try to be himself. And how do we know that so? Watch what he did in verse 7, y'all. But stripped himself. Of all privileges and rightful dignity, so as to assume the guise of a servant slave, in that he became like men and was born a human being. Now here's the illustration I want to point out to you. Recognize this. God stripped his own self, y'all. Didn't nobody come and make him strip. Didn't nobody ask him to strip. He stripped himself. Now put it in terms that we can understand. Let's go to a monarchy, y'all. Operate in a monarchy. And I used this illustration early on with some people early on in the early first part of the broadcast. Um, I'm going to take us back to the time of Camelot. Anybody know anything about history? Time of Camelot dealt with uh, 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 King Arthur and the Round Table. Amen. King Arthur and his Round Table, known as the Knights of the Round Table. Amen. And the reason why I'm going there is because... His name was Arthur and he was the king. It's good to be the king. So amen. And so, so, <laughs> praise God. So this is King Arthur and this round table. And this round table were knights. Uh, some, some, something like the cabinet of the president of the United States, of these United States of America. That would have been the king's cabinet in that monarchy. Now understand this. King Arthur, y'all, he's the king. He's, he's ruling over everything within the United Kingdom. Now imagine this. All of a sudden, one day, the king says, you know what? I don't want to be king no more. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop being a king, and I want to become a regular knight at my table. Are you kidding me? Not in those days. Kings just did not abdicate or give up their throne. You had to overthrow the king. But, king, but the king of kings, lord of lords, he stripped himself of all privileges and rightful dignity. Why? So as to assume the guise of a servant? Slave, and that he became like men and was born a human being. He did that while he was still God. But watch verse 8. And after he appeared in human form, he abased and humbled himself still further and carried his obedience to the extreme death and even the death of the cross. Now, I like this verse right here because, again, the Holy Ghost illuminated something to me the other day, and I'm hitting people with this thing, y'all. Many people say it don't take all that to be Christian or be a Christian. Why does it take all that? Why does it take all that? You know what? Understand this. It takes this and then even more, but God only accepts this, what he has in his word, y'all. It really takes much more to be a Christian. We ain't, God ain't trying to put all that on us. He says, just follow the instructions that I'm giving you here right Right now and all you got to do is that and he ain't and understand this this is why it's a relationship and not just some sort of religion where you just mindlessly just follow and do things no god ain't just telling you how to do it he's showing you how to do it this is what this verse is all about y'all it gives us a clear understanding why god said in john 3 16 for god so loved the world he gave his only begotten son that sounds powerful, but many people just gloss over that thing. Says, oh yeah, okay, he gave his only begotten son. Okay, verse uh, John 15, 13. No greater love does a man have than this than he lay down his life for his friend. Okay, that's powerful. Okay, no greater love he lay down his life for his friend. Uh, verse Romans 5, 8. But God committed his great love for us that while we were still sinners, he died for us. Oh yeah, okay, well he died for us while we were still in sin. But how he got to that point of dying, y'all, this is what he did. First of all, he humbled himself. He humbled himself. God, who does not need to humble himself for nobody. God is subject to no one, y'all. He made himself subject to his own self first and said, listen, I don't need to be who I am. I need to be less than I am. Lord have mercy. How many of you out there would be willing to be less than you are right now? And don't have to be. Yeah, you ain't got to say nothing. You ain't got to say nothing. I don't know if you, you can't say amen. Just say ouch. Amen. None of us will be willing to be less than who we are. Matter of fact, we want to be more than what we think we are. Because for some of us, we got low self-esteem. We don't feel good about our own selves. We're trying to find ourselves in other people and things. Lord have mercy. Only way you're going to find yourself is in Jesus. 
Amen. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. He's, oh my God, the Apostle Paul says, it's in him that I live and have my very being. Watch this, y'all. Uh, and he's in, 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 in verse 8, and after he appeared in human form, he abased and humbled himself still further. This is after what he did when he was God. When he stripped himself of his godliness. When he became a human, he went even further. 